Hey everyone, welcome to my review of the Rapsodio Supreme V3. So, I mean, this is not an IEM that's very well known to as many people as one would imagine this would be, given the fact that this is often considered by those that know it to be the best IEM on the planet. So that's, of course, a very easily bandied about claim, and a lot of IEMs get, you know, labeled as that. But Rapsodio is a very interesting brand, and... Um, so I think it was in CanJam Singapore in 2024, which is essentially this year, that this has begun to sort of, you know, catch attention from a wider variety and sections of the North American audio community. And a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people in East Asia and Southeast Asia have known this brand and have loved this brand. And a lot of sort of, you know, Summit Fi Hong Kong based audiophiles who love Rhapsody and what they do. So Rhapsody makes these amazing IMs. Just look at the quality of this casework, right? I mean, look at the pattern here, this engraving here, and it's just phenomenal. And in general, Rhapsody just oozes premiumness and luxury. This was evident, I think, also with the finishing of this wooden case. Uh, so this is their logo. And Rhapsody Supreme V3 is perhaps the most expensive single, di single driver IM on the planet. It is not a dynamic driver or a planar or any sort of driver type that is most commonly associated with IMs. It, it has a single ultra mag 4G dual aluminum magno, magnetostatic driver. Sorry, I'll repeat because it is a mouthful. It's a single ultra mag 4G dual aluminum magnetostatic driver. Okay, so this, is, this has magnetostatic drivers. This cable is a stock cable. I think you can buy it separately for about $1,000. It's a copper hybrid. And it, the cable itself is also just a sight to behold in terms of how premium, how premium this, this feels. Everything about this, this whole IM is just extremely premium. And so this is the quality of the cable. I'll come to the IMs in a bit. I just wanted to show off the cable. It is a beautiful color and the braiding is just top notch. It's ergonomic. It just, it, you know, it has, it doesn't have a whole lot of memory. It's not difficult to coil. It has just a bit of weight, which I think is fine. It's terminated in 4.4. The weight is fine, given the fact that these have brass shells. Now, these gold-colored brass shells are, of course, extremely beautiful, as may be evident. And um, yeah, so I, I just dig the colors here. They're heavy, but somehow I don't find them to be very uh, uncomfortable. And, and I just think they're shaped very beautifully. Uh, these shells, however, will pick up scratches more easily than you think and, of course, attract fingerprints. And finally, I do want to talk about the price of this. The price of the Rhapsody Supreme version 3 is a whopping $6,399, so a $6,400 IM. And you can get upgrade cables. People go crazy with cables. And Rhapsody also, incidentally, has some fantastic cables. A lot of people buy this and then they buy a $3,000 cable that Rhapsody sells. This comes with a variety of tips and cleaning equipment. It's pretty perfunctory in terms of the unboxing, but it's nice nonetheless. So this one has 17 ohm impedance and 97 decibels of sensitivity. I mean, one would think that it's fairly easy to drive and it is, but it does scale with power. And this was evident when I drove it with my Sony DAP, the Sony WM1 ZM2, which you see here, right here. And the Sony is wonderful. It's also a nice aesthetic match with the uh, Rapsodio. And, and this scales, of course, on the Sony and Ibasso PB5 combo. So before I talk about how it scales, let's just talk about its sounds. In terms of its frequency response, this is perhaps one of the most interesting IEMs I've heard because these magnetostatic drivers in some ways remind me of a halfway house between a, a dynamic driver and an e-stat. Because in many ways, it has a timbre of a dynamic driver. It sounds very realistic. It has the cohesiveness of a single dynamic driver, even the impact of the bass, but it has that ethereal quality in, in the mid-range and treble that you get from e-stats. And by that, I don't mean the sort of, you know, have done e-stats you get with IMs. I mean, like, the e-stats sound you get from, let's say, a stack set phone. So it's a very interesting timbre, and it's difficult to describe. And the best you can do is watch this review and read a bunch of other impressions of what this sounds like, because the sound, the timbre of this driver is very unique. Like I said, it sounds like an e-stat in mid-range and treble, but also has a weight 
that E styles tend to not have when it comes to bass frequencies is cohesive, is coherent, like dynamic drivers tend to be, but it doesn't sound like a dynamic driver, it doesn't sound like a planar, it doesn't sound like an E style, it sounds like itself, and perhaps it's the R&D that's one of the reasons that explains the cost of this, the price of this. So in terms of the overall frequency response, I do feel that it's warmer than cooler. In fact, it's, I would say it's, it's, it's noticeably warm. It's warm of neutral. I haven't seen an FR of this. So I'm going to just describe what I feel it sounds like having used different tips, sources and all that. So I'm giving you an approximation of the sound. It's a warm sounding set. There's a lot of mid bass, there's upper bass, there is lower mid. So it, it is a mid range first, a lower mid range upper bass first I am. In that it does remind me of a Sennheiser HD 650 because it is warm, it's lovely, it's romantic. Sub bass is not wanting, sub bass does hit hard, it's deep. So overall it's, I think in many ways, a bass first, lower mids first I am. I know that sounds, sound signature appeals to a lot of you because when you have a bass first, lower mids first I am, it does play well with different genres and a lot of you like a bit of extra dollop of bass. So this does give you that. It doesn't have the sort of Harman bass shelf and bass presence that maybe T Audio IMs do or in the upper end of the spectrum, Empire Ears IMs do because Empire Ears IMs are very hard hitting, very, very impactful. So this is by no means the Sony IRZ1R, but it's not very, very far, if you know what I mean. It's, it's not up to that level of bass sort of presence, but it's bassy. It's bassy, it's warm, the bass is very textured, and mids are wonderful, the upper mids are present. I don't find them to be shouty or protruding. The treble is what I think is really interesting because on a lot of sources like the Sony and on a bunch of others, I have found the treble to be rather wanting. So I like treble and you might not like treble. So the treble here is rounded. I don't think it's absent, it's just rounded. So it does make for fatigue-free all day listening and listening across different genres. So for that, I give this massive kudos. However, when I do pair this with more treble first kind of sources like Ibasso sources tend to have very present treble or Kine sources have to have very present treble, this sounds more complete. This sounds better rounded. So if you're looking to pair this with different DAPs, I wouldn't recommend the Sony unless you are a great aficionado of warmth and unless warm and warm is what you seek, because the two sort of you know uh, pieces of gear here are both warm, and they do sound quite warm when they're paired. On the other hand, with Ibasso DX260 that I have, it sounds faster, lighter, and more present in the treble, which does aid, let's say, the presence of instruments, the imaging of instruments even, and it does also aid in the attack of guitars and so forth. So overall, it's a warm set. That does change its essential character to a degree, depending on what source you drive it with. And for that matter, I also, you know, tip roll this a lot and I've tried different tips and it does sound different with different tips, right? And, and for that, I think it's, you know, something that I think is, is, um, will appeal to a lot of you because uh, different kinds of tips do, I think, you know, uh, it's widely known to affect sound. So this, these are filters that you just saw me put back. And yeah, so overall, very, very interesting. These IMs are very, very interesting. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, uh, uh, recommend that one blind buys IMs of the stature and of this price point, because these are six thousand four hundred dollar IMs. Nobody should be blind buying anything worth that price, whether it's a luxury good like a bag or a watch or an IM. If it's a watch, you should try the watch on your hand because what the watch looks like on the website might be very different from what it looks like on your wrist. And just as is the case with this IM, it's an expensive IM. I like it. I do think it holds its own with other IMs that are priced in the six thousand dollar category. And I will. I, I, and I plan to do another review or video where I AB this with the Ormo Audio Jewel, which is five thousand two hundred dollars, and one of my favorite IMs of all time. So you get a sense of what this does and what the Jewel does in relation to each other. But this is fantastic. And before I finish this, I do want to talk about its technicalities because that's just something it does really well. This has a very wide and engulfing sound stage, which is impressive because it's not very trebly. So you know for, the, for a fact that the spaciousness it generates and you do hear sounds coming from outside of your sort of, you know, physical anatomy, meaning it's out of the head, so to speak. At least that's what the psycho psychoacoustics do for you with this IM. 
it's spacious and out of the head without having a very present treble, which is interesting. I mean, it's not bereft of air frequency, so there is that. But it's also not the airiest sounding I am I've ever heard. It's, it's, the air frequencies here are just fine. Yet it sounds massive, cauldron like massive in terms of front to back, massive in terms of vertical height and also width. Imaging is wonderful. I think imaging is great for the price. I mean, it's not wanting for the price rather. Dynamics and impact are wonderful. Timbre is wonderful. This is an all, all rounder I am guys. It does nothing wrong. It's safe. It's even safer than the jewel tuning. As a matter of fact, while the jewel can, I think border on boring, this is perhaps a little more flavored and colorful because it's warm in the lower mids and, and upper bass. But of course, that's just a very quick discussion. I will dive deeper into this IM and comparisons with other high-end stuff. Maybe I'll do a, a comparison with the Earl Audio Jewel and the Soft Ears uh, flagship the Enigma. So that's for later, guys. If you like this video, do give this a like and follow my work if you have not. And if you have further questions on this, I mean, do feel free to engage me in the comments. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.